So I think it's probably apt that I'm talking at the end, because I'm talking about the end, hopefully, of um, tobacco as a major public health um, a problem in our region. So it may seem like a bit of a wild idea um, that we could actually end the cigarette epidemic, uh, but you know I think it's, uh, it's something that we need to need to start talking about seriously. Okay. Okay. So before I begin, I'd just like to uh, acknowledge uh, country, and I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land where we now stand, the Jagara and the Turbul peoples. Uh, they are the traditional custodians of the land and they have never ceded sovereignty. So I wish to pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people continue to play within our community. So in this talk I'm going to go through the range of tobacco and nicotine products that are available and uh, what is the tobacco endgame, give a bit of an um, overview of how it's been discussed in the literature and uh, what conditions uh, might be necessary for us to actually get there and achieve it. And, uh, and then I'm going to look at what uh, endgame proposals have been uh, discussed in our region, in the Asia Pacific region and um, some attempts to implement them. And um, what I'd like to point out is also that this is just to kind of um, stimulate discussion about these topics. Um, I could easily give a whole talk on each separate one individually, so I won't be discussing them in detail. So to begin with, um, here we've got um, different tobacco and nicotine products that I've kind of grouped together in different um, categories. So here at the end we have your combustible tobacco products. Um, these are all um, set on fire and inhaled. Uh, in the middle you have your smokeless tobacco products, so these are sort of chewing tobaccos, oral snuffs. And then we've got your medicinal uh, nicotine products up here which are used to help people quit smoking. And then we have these kind of um, boundary products that are um, new products mostly and uh, they kind of are a bit of an odd category here where they have some similarities to these products the recreational products, so they're marketed as recreational products, but they also have some similarities here with the medicinal nicotine products because they're using often extracted nicotine from tobacco. So, but in, so this is your whole spectrum of nicotine and tobacco products, but in my talk I'm going to be focusing mostly on this one here, which is your um, combustible manufactured cigarette, which is the cause of most of the tobacco related harms that we experience. So what is the tobacco end game? So what we're talking about here is not just a vague you know, desire to end the tobacco epidemic, but an explicit government goal to get down to close to zero smoking prevalence. And also a target end date. So um, some researchers have proposed that that should be a maximum of 20 years, because if it's too far into the future, it's like sort of the rainbow, you just never get there. So it has to have some kind of reasonable time frame that the government's going to try to uh, achieve it in. And they also need a clear strategy for achieving it. So just talking about um, being tough on tobacco or you know, um, increasing taxes and so on is probably not enough um, to get there. Probably need to be a little bit more innovative, innovative in how we apply strategies and new strategies. And um, of course anything new is going to be difficult uh, and so there are some conditions that may be required to get there. So um, this uh, group of researchers, uh, George Thompson, um, Nick Wilson, uh, Richard Edwards and Tony Blakely uh, at uh, Otago University have proposed that you probably need a smoking prevalence of less than 15% before you can start seriously talking about this and you need good public support. And I think also this one here, strong and visionary political leadership is key. So we saw an excellent example of that with Nicola Roxon getting the tobacco plant packaging in. So if we didn't have that sort of leadership, it would be very difficult to uh, in introduce any new, um, quite um, more uh, radical strategies. Um, if you didn't have that, um, that person at the top that was willing to push it through and fight for that policy. And also, this one's also quite important too, consensus among public health community on the best approach. So at the moment, there is a little bit of uh, maybe disagreement on how we should be pursuing this. OK, 
Okay, so the next slide I'd like to go through sort of w which countries look like they might be getting ripe for discussing this type of, um, you know, end of the epidemic. So if we're using this 15% uh, as a guide, then we have four countries in the Asia Pacific that have a smoking prevalence of less than 15%. I've actually organised um, these smoking prevalences in order of male smoking prevalence because the problem is that if you've got some countries with very low female smoking, then that hides the fact that there can be very high male smoking. So I think the whole, you know, 15% overall is probably not enough. You also need to have low smoking prevalence here. But anyway, if we're just looking at um, overall smoking prevalence, you've got Bhutan, Australia, India and Sri Lanka that have... Um, reach that, that goal. So there are other issues, I guess, in some of these countries, like India and Sri Lanka, there's a high proportion of smokeless tobacco that is used. But if we're just uh, looking for the sake of um, smoking um, combustible cigarettes, then um, these are the countries that are, um, I guess, at the forefront of smoking prevalence in our region. So um, overall, again, um, overall prevalences can hide um, s substantial uh, male smoking. So what public support is there for um, ending cigarette sales in our region? So in Australia, um, there have been a, a few surveys done, public um, opinion surveys, and the majority actually support, and there's only minor minority opposition to banning cigarette retailing. So um, a lot of people think, oh, this is a very radical thing, but you know, for the public, they actually, you know, it makes a bit of sense. Um, so in 2008, there were 60% of New South Wales uh, adults that were surveyed and 30% of smokers actually agreed that tobacco should be prohibited within a 10-year uh, time frame. Uh, in 2009, only 9% of Victorian adults uh, and 20% of smokers thought it would be a bad thing if one day cigarettes were not available for sale in retail outlets. In 2010, only 26% of Victorian adults thought retail sales of uh, cigarettes should not be phased out. And you're talking about half of adults um, and 42% uh, of smokers believe that a ban should occur within the next 10 years. So sometimes the public is actually a bit more ahead of their thinking than um, what we give them credit for. Uh, there's also been some public support surveys done in other countries, so in New Zealand, uh, surveys done between 2007 and 2012, um, looking at support for banning sales um, within a 10-year time frame. Uh, support ranged um, there between 18% and 46% of smokers and 58% over, overall, but uh, most, most of them were around this sort of, you know, 50% uh, mark of support for banning retail sales. And a survey in Hong Kong uh, also found that, you know, there was, there was majority support amongst never smokers, ex-smokers, and even high level of support amongst current smokers, 45%, that supported a sales ban within 10 years. So let's look at countries that have expressed an end game goal. They've um, specified, a, you know, an explicit goal to get down to a very low smoking prevalence. Some people have said, you know, less than 5% is an end game. So Bhutan, um, they actually um, implemented a complete tobacco sales ban. That was in 2004. Uh, New Zealand has had a long-term goal of reducing smoking prevalence and tobacco availability to minimal levels and with the idea of making New Zealand a smoke-free country, essentially. And they've set 2025 as their goal. It's quite ambitious. I would say. Uh, and Malaysia's also set a goal um, to reduce smoking prevalence to 15% by 2025 and then 5% by 2045. So it's a bit out of the 20-year um, time frame. And um, when we look at what the um, Malaysian government sort of expressed in how they're achieving that, it's all standard sort of um, strategies. They haven't really been too uh, progressive in what they propose. So the next uh, part of this talk, I'm going to go through what are some of the ways that people have uh, discussed that we might be able to end uh, the tobacco epidemic in, or cigarette epidemic in uh, the Asia Pacific region. So these can be sort of categorised into uh, supply and sort of demand reduction uh, strategies and also product standards is another area that people have looked at and discussed. 
So the first one, I guess, is pretty straightforward. We're talking about a complete ban on retail sales. So this has been discussed by uh, Robert Proctor, and he just um, described it as being abolition. So in um, contrast to prohibition, it wouldn't be making it um, a criminal offence to smoke or to um, possess um, tobacco or cigarettes, but you would not be able to sell it for profit. And we do have an example here um, of Bhutan, who banned the distribution of tobacco products in 2004. Uh, there's also a news report um, from Sri Lanka saying that there were 107 towns that have um, boycotted the sale of cigarettes. But I found it very difficult finding much information about this. So I'm not sure if it's a bit of an urban myth, uh, but there has been some um, media report about this. And there's also an example from the Philippines in Balanga City um, that did try to implement a ban. And this also features in the Aspire 2025 uh, New Zealand plan. So if we look a bit more at um, what happened in Bhutan, so it is an uh, interesting case study of a country that did bring in um, a complete ban on retailing. Uh, it's actually wider than that. So um, this is a, a small country that's uh, landlocked between China and India. And um, they were starting to get a bit concerned about increasing tobacco use, um, particularly amongst youth, was a catalyst for um, starting to discuss taking some more radical action. They'd signed the um, WHO FCTC and ratified it. And um, they had um, actually at the local level started uh, banning the sale of tobacco um, in local jurisdictions. But then in 2004, they brought in a nationwide ban on the sale of all tobacco products. So that also included your smokeless tobacco products as well as cigarettes. Uh, and also brought in some bans in public use. Uh, personal possession and use uh, was legal. Uh, and you were allowed to import it within certain limits, um, so small quantities, and they implemented 100% excise tax on imported tobacco. Uh, they also passed another law then in 2010 that retained the uh, ban on um, tobacco sales and uh, implemented the National Tobacco Control Board to um, manage it. They also brought in some um, bans on um, tobacco advertising and promotion activities and included uh, a ban on tobacco use in um, domestically produced movies. So you couldn't be featuring smoking in um, any of the movies that, that were produced in the country. So I guess, it, was it successful? Well, it's a bit difficult because there aren't very good uh, historical data on smoking prevalence in Bhutan. So it's a bit hard to see what was happening. So it could be that smoking was on the way up and this may have arrested uh, an increase. Uh, but it does look like, uh, from the data that, that we have, um, that it wasn't overly successful in reducing smoking. So this is after the um, uh, ban was brought in in 2007, um, 2008, we had 10% of men and 3.4% of women smoking. Um, there was another study in 2008 that also found 10% of men, a high estimate for women smoking. And this 2014 uh, survey found 10.8% of men and 3.1% of women. So not really a big difference between the, um, over that seven year period there between those surveys. And there is also um, some evidence of increase, continuing increase of, of um, smoking amongst uh, teenagers there, looking at the global youth tobacco surveys. And there were also reports of um, smuggling increasing uh, in the years following the implementation, implementation of the ban. But you know, there might be some um, good uh, lessons that we can still learn from this. So it may not have um, reduced smoking tobacco use, uh, but there is this lack of quality data there, so we don't really know whether it may have had some positive impact. Um, there's certainly been problems with smuggling and personal importation, and the implementation and um, uh, monitoring and so on is obviously um, an ongoing problem. Um, there are downsides there. By allowing only personal importation, you're kind of relying on um, the countries that are exporting it to be packaging it with your warning labels and so on, because you no longer have control over it if you're not allowing products to be sold within your country. 
So it's unclear also if allowing some lower risk nicotine or tobacco products would offset some of this, um, importation and smuggling. And it's also um, you know, unknown whether maybe a uh, restricted domestic access would have been better than a complete ban, because at least then they could have controlled the warnings on the packs and, um, and, and at, you know, the um, way it was packaged and so on. There was also this um, attempt to introduce a sales ban in Balanga City in the Philippines. So there was ordinance uh, brought in in uh, 2010 and it was a, a comprehensive um, ban on smoking. Uh, so it banned the use, the sale, the distribution, advertising and promotion within certain areas within the city. Uh, there was another um, ordinance brought in in uh, 2016 that again prohibited sale, distribution, advertising, promotion of tobacco products. And, uh, and then also uh, later in 2016, they brought in a tobacco-free generation end game strategy ordinance for the city. So um, the goal of this one would be to ban the sale of tobacco products to anyone born uh, in the city, uh, uh, anyone in the city who had been born uh, on or after the 1st of January 2000. So they actually did implement um, this ban uh, in uh, 2017. But of course, by July, we had the um, uh, opposition from the tobacco industry and eventually uh, the court decided against um, the smoke-free ordinance and found it unconstitutional and invalid. So uh, this got repealed then, unfortunately. So um, I guess the um, appeals are ongoing, but um, again, there might be lessons in there looking at um, an unsuccessful attempt. So clearly there was political leadership within the, the town to bring in and do something. So at the lo local government area um, district, you can find some um, tobacco control leaders there who are willing to um, push the boundaries and try something. So we have this tobacco free millennium generation policy. So that um, was, they tried to bring that in, in um, the Philippines, in Belanga City. And this was proposed by academics at National University Singapore. And the idea here is to ban the sales of tobacco to people born after a certain year. So it was originally proposed that that year would be 2000 and that you'd bring it in to implement in 2018. So then no one um, after that year, um, of that generation would be able to legally purchase um, cigarette products. So we also have an example from Tasmania in 2014 uh, who tried to implement this. So the Tasmanian Public Health Amendment Tobacco Free Generation Bill 2014 was a private member's bill that was introduced by uh, an independent uh, member of parliament, Ivan Dean. And the idea here would be to raise the tobacco purchase age from 18 to 21 years initially, and then again to 25 years in 2025. So it was an incremental increase there. Uh, as a result of um, this, they got um, the Tasmanian Anti-Discrimination Commissioner to look at it, and they advised that the bill does not constitute unlawful discrimination. And, that there were, and it was also found there was no significant legal impediment to introducing it. Uh, and it even got to de being debated in the Tasmanian Parliament, but they didn't make a decision on it and it's since lapsed. So it didn't really go uh, much further than being discussed in Parliament. So as, I guess, a compromise or maybe a baby step towards the tobacco free generation, we have this um, T21 bill that's currently been introduced uh, into uh, Tasmanian Parliament. And the idea here would be just to raise the tobacco purchase age to age 21 from 18. Um, and this has had um, some support from some high profile backers. So there's uh, Andrew Forrest from the Mindaroo Foundation has um, put in some money towards this. Yeah, a little bit of money. And also there are other prominent supporters such as uh, Andrew Wilkie, who's quite well known, uh, federal MP in Tasmania. And um, the debate, this was meant to be debated by now, um, but it's been delayed to October. So next month, uh, it'll be debated. Uh, the next uh, model I'd like to talk about is um, a regulated market model. So this was proposed by Ron Borland at Cancer Council Victoria. And the idea behind here is that the government takes over control of uh, how tobacco products are wholesaled. So um, 
A government controlled agency would be both the regulator and the sole purchaser of tobacco products from manufacturers and importers. So they would have complete control then over what products would be distributed if all products had to be supplied through this um, agency that was controlled by the government. So you could set standards, you could say, you know, set the um, nicotine level that was in the tobacco products, you could control how it was uh, labelled and packaged. So this might be another way to introduce plain packaging is if the government controlled all the um, uh, supply, they could just decide which, how they were going to package it. And um, so this um, proposal would be a radical change in the way that um, tobacco would be supplied and you could set um, goals and types of outlets that would be allowed to uh, supply and um, put some uh, incentives to move people to other products, so you know, medicinal nicotine products and so on. Uh, also a cap and trade scheme has been proposed by uh, researchers at Otago University, so there's a lot of sort of innovative in a, I was getting mixed up with that, that, uh, that word. Uh, very radical strategies coming out of Otago University. Um, uh, and so this one was proposing that a quota would be imposed on tobacco products that were manufactured and imported into a country. And then the industry would bid for their share of the quota to supply, and you'd continually be reducing the quota every year. So the price would naturally go up because there would be more competition for a reducing amount available. Um, and it would also enforce a reduction in the amount of tobacco against a timeline. Um, so similar to carbon trading emissions uh, schemes and fishing limits. Uh, I don't have any examples of anyone that's tried to implement that in our region. There was an attempt in the States actually, but it um, didn't get up. So smoker licensing is another, um, I guess, more radical strategy that was proposed by Emeritus Professor Simon Chapman uh, when he was at the University of Sydney. And um, his proposal here was that smokers would need to obtain a licence to purchase tobacco. Uh, new users would have to confirm that they understood the risks they were taking on and there would be limits placed on how much that you could purchase under your licence conditions. So it would also encourage people to limit their intake and uh, there would be different levels of licences that you could purchase to encourage people to trade down to uh, reduce their intake and also incentives to quit smoking because you could get some money back on your licence if you quit smoking and returned your licence and so that would also help uh, with relapse because then you couldn't just go and purchase after you'd um, surrendered your licence. So he's uh, suggested gun licences and medicines prescriptions as being examples. Again, uh, this hasn't really been tried anywhere. Uh, another idea would be swinging taxes, so just radically increasing the, the cost of tobacco, making it unaffordable to purchase cigarettes. And so uh, I guess examples here of where we've got sort of um, pushing the boundaries of current prices, we have Australia implemented one off 25% tax increase in 2010 and then a 12.5% annual increase from 2013 to 2020. So we're coming up to the last of these incremental annual increases now next year. So this is something that I guess the government should be saying to think about whether they want to continue uh, doing this. Uh, similarly in New Zealand, they implemented a 10% per annum increase from 2010 to 2020. Um, a group um, of tobacco control advocates in um, Hong Kong proposed uh, raising the tax of 100 per, by 100% um, to try and achieve an end game by 2027. So that's another um, example of proposal to use tax. So if we look at the price of a pack of cigarettes around the world, and this is in US dollars, uh, we actually do have in Australia and New Zealand the highest cigarette prices in the world now. So. We are, I guess, at the forefront of using price as a strategy. Um, New Zealand researchers, again, at Otago University did some modelling of this. So they looked at the New Zealand 10% annual increase and they concluded that it would have a significant impact on smoking. But if we're talking about achieving an end game, um, then the current 10% annual would not be enough. It wouldn't be extreme enough to get there. So you would have to be looking at other measures or more extreme um, tobacco tax increases. 
The, uh, another proposal looking more at product standards here is actually taking the nicotine out of cigarettes. So this was proposed um, back in 1994. Uh, so this is different from your light cigarettes which get a lower reading when you smoke them in a smoking machine because the um, uh, the way the cigarette's designed, it dilutes the smoke, but it doesn't actually um, reduce exposure to the smoker. But this is changing the nicotine content of the actual tobacco in the cigarette. So this was um, something that was proposed a while ago. So if you took the cigarette, uh, took the nicotine out of cigarettes, people probably wouldn't smoke them for too much longer. And the FDA in the US actually announced that they were going to seriously look into this as a strategy and there are some clinical trials to support it um, that that also show that you may not even need to do like a gradual reduction but you could probably just bring it in um, pretty pretty quickly and um, also this would help um, stop uh, experimental use amongst youth um, converting converting into persistent use so that's been uh, discussed in a few um, proposals including um, in New Zealand so uh, this strategy uh, was proposed by uh, Nigel Gray. Dr Gray was the director of the Cancer Council Victoria. So he proposed that you could phase out cigarettes over a five to ten year time frame. And he sort of looked at short term, medium term and longer term goals here. So he was focusing very much on product regulation here and looking at the whole nicotine and tobacco market and trying to bring everything into one regulatory system. So going all the way from your medicinal nicotine products uh, um, through to your more uh, newer products like you know your vaping products, um, smokeless tobacco and then also your combustible tobacco products. So uh, this would be removing, in Australia we have an exemption from drugs and poisons regulations um, for smoke tobacco products, so this would be removing that exemption and bringing it all into one regulatory framework. And he proposed that if you made cleaner nicotine products uh, as available as tobacco while you also try to decrease availability so of the smoke tobacco products, so kind of a levelling down and a levelling up type of activity, that this would help um, with trying to phase out that lev with the levelling down of the smoke tobacco availability. Uh, so he said that, you know, one of the things you could also do is set standards for the toxicants that are inhaled with nicotine. Uh, in the medium term, you just keep um, ramping it down the cigarette market, but also allowing uh, a wider range of um, non-combustible nicotine products to be sold to give people alternatives. And uh, you could do things like also removing the nicotine from the cigarettes, again, to try and um, move people off the combustible cigarettes. And then in the longer term, you would then look at trying to reduce the overall nicotine uh, market. So that was uh, proposed by Dr Gray. Uh, and we've also had um, the New Zealand Aspire 2025 uh, uh, plan. So that's proposed by a collaboration of tobacco control researchers and advocates. And they've kind of put together a number of these sort of more radical and also traditional tobacco control strategies together into a plan and say, well, look, here's a strategy for a country and how we could achieve our 2025 smoke-free goal. So this is in um, including things like more radical tobacco tax tax increases, so going up 20% annually instead of the current 10%, minimum retail prices set, uh, also phasing out general retailing by 2021, they proposed, and allowing a small number of uh, specialised outlets to sell um, tobacco. Uh, they also included the tobacco-free generation policy in this, product standards, and also providing uh, access to alternative nicotine delivery systems and quit smoking support. And also enhancing you know, the very important traditional tobacco control activities that we have, such as our graphic health warnings, plain packaging, and so on. So um, they put together this proposal that kind of combined a few different things into it. So in conclusion about the tobacco endgame in the Asia Pacific, so there are some countries that have got some conditions that are supportive of an endgame. So for example, Bhutan were actually able to bring in um, a, a complete retail sales ban because there was strong political leadership that were um, supporting that policy. They already had low smoking prevalence and there were certain conditions that were available there. Uh, 
other countries such as Australia are already down below 15%, so this is where we could potentially start looking at being a little bit more radical perhaps. And there have been a number of um, new, more radical policies that have been proposed, and they've also been, you know, attempts to introduce them in some of um, our region. And um, of course, though, you know, we still have a long way to go in most countries in our region, unfortunately. If you, um, the slide that I had earlier on, you see there aren't that many countries that are down at this other end, but, you know, developing and trialling new strategies and proposals uh, is a good idea for those countries at the forefront because this can help, um, you know, cross-pollinate to other regions and also demonstrate, um, you know, an end in sight for other countries as well that may be a bit further along. Okay. Thank you.